This is Startup to Storefront. When it comes to the art world, you have artists, dealers, and collectors. Dealers have been around almost as long as humans have been selling art, linking buyers and artists together all over the globe. The relationship between an artist and a dealer was originally based on commerce, but eventually evolved into one that included sincere advocacy and patronage. The art dealers of today are just as much talent managers as they are brokers. This is very much the case for our guest today, Arushi Kapoor. Arushi has been involved in the art world since her teenage years, starting with an internship at Sotheby's and launching from there into opening up her own galleries all over the world. She's a champion of artists, both upcoming and established, and she's here today to talk with us about the contemporary art world, both analog and digital. So listen in as we cover everything from why an artist needs around a thousand pieces before they have a recognizable style, the frustrations of being a financial coach to artists, and why you don't need to have a great business mindset to get represented as an artist, you just need to be better than the most awkward person in the room. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Arushi from Arushi Gallery. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. For people who don't know, what do you do? I am an art dealer and a gallerist. I work with artists in the primary market where I focus on minority and female artists. I work with artists in the secondary market with clients. I buy and sell artworks. I do alternative asset divisions with large family companies. I provide artworks to museums. The whole deal in the art world, I do anything related to art. How did you get into this, this world? Um, I got into it very early. How um, early? Because you're young. You're young today. So people, for, for those listening, how uh, early? 16. Okay. Wow. It was honestly because I needed some project for my university. So I was like, what am I going to do? I Were you here in America or were you somewhere else? No, I was interning with Sotheby's in London. Okay. And then I went to India and interned with the Indian Express newspaper where I was like writing small snippets of like things happening in town. And then right after that, I actually wrote a book called Talking Art by Rushi Kapoor, which was a book that like is studied in like colleges and uni- and um, now is a part of a bunch of museums now. So I got very lucky with it. But it was basically 16 Southeast Asian contemporary artists that I spoke with. And the premise of the book was what are the barriers to entry for them to actually blow up in the Western world? The Western art world is miles ahead in terms of value and valuation. Uh, Not in in terms of aesthetics, but like in terms of valuation of art. Was it because of the exposure? It's because of the exposure. Um, Does it also have to do with colonization? um, I would say it does, yes. Because due to colonization, a lot of the times we were told as like, non-Caucasian people that like we were not good enough like in India for example they would say that dogs and like brown people or dogs and Indians were not allowed in certain places so like I think a part of it was definitely that barrier to entry created due to colonization not directly but like indirectly but that gives like a barrier to like language and like even if people don't actively think about this right now like it is something that like it has been ingrained in like previous generations. So like you think that like if you're a lighter skin colored, like you're like in some way superior, but like in the art world, particularly in this book, we, that is not exactly what we were speaking about. We were speaking about more present day scenarios that like uh, international artists. Now I'm talking about like the top artists of India at the time uh, that I was very lucky to hound and get an interview with talking about how they are not able to like converse in the Western world and explain their ideas and their paintings the same way that like the Western artists would or even that like they aren't given the same chance in like the galleries in like the larger galleries the Gagosians and the David Werners and the Hauser and Wirtz because their valuation of their artworks are is a lot lesser than like what the valuation of their counterparts that were making similar artworks in the Western world at a similar period of time would be. If I'm an artist, there's people listening. So I'm an artist. I've decided to create art, call myself an artist. I'm making stuff. And at some point, who decides what it's worth, right? So is it is it that 
I have maybe a team behind me and I'm getting some exposure and I'm doing small galleries and people are liking it and they're selling it for like hundreds of dollars? Or is it the complete opposite where I'm in a lab working for five years, 10 years, I get my art to a point where I'm like, okay, I want to go big. Nothing has sold yet. And that's been on, that's been intentional. And now I need like a dealer. So both of those ways realistically are options. What I tell my artists that I work with as their dealer is if you actually want the valuation of your artworks to go up, you at least need a thousand artworks out there. So people recognize your style. You can set a price yourself as an artist, but people are not going to buy it for that price unless there's something backing it up, right? Like unless what? there's like what? a track record of sales. Like you can't just wake up one day and be like, oh, my artwork is $100,000 because I spend this much time on it. But like, okay, for sure, you have the right to price it that way and it may sell. But like... Will it continuously sell at that price? Probably not because there's not a track record of it. Versus if you're an artist that's like starting out and like you're first pricing it at five and then 7,500 7, because you've sold a couple of works at five and then going to 10,000 and then it like get, goes into auction and goes for 50 and then you're pl pricing yours according to the auction. There's like a trajectory that's being followed and a lot more people would be likely to consider your artwork an asset if that's the way you go about it rather than if you just price it in a way that like you think is fair. And just from the market perspective, like here we have James Peter Henry, who's an artist. He has got a bunch of murals in LA. I like his art. I'm a fan. But is art a function of just like perceived value or is it a function of really understanding the artist? And so understanding that James likes African art and so he like where he draws inspiration. Does that matter at all? Or does 100%, that 100% it 100% okay. uh, matters what the artist is inspired by is how relevant it is in the world today. That's what people are responding to. People aren't just responding to how it looks physically. I mean, you got him to do this mural here. I'm sure you researched something about what his background was before just putting it out there for aesthetic purposes. So like it definitely promotes people buying it according to what they're standing for. Okay. At what point do they find you? Or at what point do you find them, maybe, is the better question. For every million artists, there's only 100,000 collectors and 10,000 dealers and galleries. And collectors are like people just buying the art. In collectors okay. are people just so buying the not art. Not many people, 100,000 people. Yeah. What? What wow. is there a... a, a entry point for being considered a collector like you have to have so many pieces by so many or like you know if you're buying an artwork you're in, you're a collector and am my i a books. collector because i have this yeah oh, i wow. mean if you collect artworks you're a collector now there's different levels within collectors that are like i mean larry gagosian just bought that marilyn monroe piece for 195 million i mean i would say 99 percent of this world cannot afford that <laughs> so like i mean he's a collector but he's obviously in a different level than like you or even me as a collector so there's definitely different levels of collector but if you buy an artwork you're a collector for sure but in terms of like just under like people finding me or me finding them, I get sent emails from artists all the time. I get sent artists on Instagram all the time. It really depends. What are, so they, what are they asking you for? To be represented. So okay. once an artist is represented by a gallery, typically the gallery is more or less responsible for placing the artworks and pushing the artist's career. So it's, I would say it's almost an equivalent of an artist manager in the music industry where it's our responsibility to make sure that the artists, and not only like you can have one representation, like one gallery that's representing you, or you could have multiple galleries that's representing you. And in both cases, like either as a collective we're responsible for it, or the gallery as an individual is responsible for it. The best way to get represented by a gallery is to probably attend the art shows and like introduce yourself to the gallery director personally before sending an email. If you're just sending a cold call, Unless your artwork is exceptional and I've seen nothing like it, 
I mean, that happens very rarely. And like a lot of the times you'll also see artworks are similar, but an artist is better than the other artist is like, just like objectively from like a dealer's perspective. Cause like I see artworks every day. So like, I just think that like, unless your artwork is extremely special and individual and you're cold calling me, you're going to get a response from me. Yes. But like, you're going to go in a big file of artists that are wanting to be represented by the gallery. And like, you won't get like a time of the day versus if you actually attend a couple of the gallery show and like the director knows you and then you send them an email, like chances are they're going to be like, oh, I recognize this name. This person's come to the gallery. They've supported the gallery just from like a perspective of like a viewer, even if not as a collector. I'm happy to call them in and have a conversation with Are them. Are artists good at that though? Like I, I can't imagine an artist is like very business minded or they haven't learned that yet. And so are you are you hearing from their manager? Or are you hearing, do they even have a manager yet? Until and unless you've reached a certain established level, yeah. you don't have a manager. And this is why it's hard to right. like get represented by artists because most artists do not have that. Right, they don't, and they're not good at it. Well, not even not good at it. I don't think most artists understand that that's the way of going about it. I mean, this is not like something that you need to be specifically business minded to like accomplish. Like you just need to be not the most awkward person in the room <laughs> to go and introduce yourself to like someone else. But like, I don't think most artists know that this is what, this is also a part of their job until they get represented. Once they do get represented and they do have like a, management or a, like a gallery then it like then things change and then they they don't have to do it their manager or the gallery has to like think of like their placements and where they're showing in group shows and all of that and like getting deals but like until you're at that level and you're a brand new artist I mean even like again a brand new music artist or a brand new dealer like me, I had to go to every single gallery and introduce myself to people. And I had to go like, I literally, when I started, I was waiting under collectors houses as a very creepy person, but I was young and looking innocent, so it wasn't as creepy. <laughs> but like, I was wait, I was trying to catch collectors, the top collectors on their way in and out of like their galleries and what would you like say what would you say to them i would introduce myself to them and tell them that like i'm a young art dealer and, and i would coming. like to you're the next thing yeah i would like to show you artists that i have like okay you know and I, then what, I, what happens if they say yes so then and then well a lot of them actually decided to have like tea with me that's the thing unless you put yourself out there as an entrepreneur in any industry you're not getting like anything in you gotta return. become a salesperson right. yeah you everyone needs to be a salesperson no matter what industry they're in if speak on it but you gotta I get uncomfortable there was some pushback though because you're a young a lot of pushback dealer, like then you have no track record so it, it almost seems to me like it would fall in the line of you have no track record therefore no one's sure whether they can trust you or not so like how do you build that confidence that that you can but it's inspiring though like it's you're, you're crazy enough to think you are and so therefore i mean that's how it works right if you're crazy enough to think you are then you probably might be at some point in the future i 100 percent agree with it i mean as opposed to what like he not thinks he's even fast on a bike he's not fast but he thinks he's fast on a <laughs> faster bike faster than him that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't know about this i would have to that's like, exactly right you don't know yeah. but you believe me more than him and that's all he's, that matters in just, this very very it's, it's objective here he's trying well, to boost it his depends own ego. on who's selling it more <laughs> i'm always gonna sell it harder <laughs> but like i mean all right so like, they give you a chance you have some tea and then and then do like, you explain your grand vision or do you like what, what are you what do you, you show saying? your artist like you show okay. your artist like okay. you need people to give you a chance in any industry if someone comes to me so how do I you mean, pick your artist then same i'm giving them a chance like okay. someone that i think has potential okay. and that i have clients for yeah. i'll give them a chance i want to do this real time and by like this he's a friend of mine i don't really care if he's a good artist i just like him when you look at this art is it objectively like what is it that runs through your head here are you going okay Da, 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 da. Like what, what? I'm just trying to gather your analysis of of this piece, which is representative. A lot of his pieces are similar in terms of style. So, like for for his artworks in particular, for his artwork, right? Yeah. Like from what I'm seeing, is he's abstract, figurative right now. So there's figures, but like most of it, when you see it in the first glance, it's abstract. Figurative artists are doing absolutely amazingly well right now. And as, the, as like a in terms of a like as a yeah as a genre. Okay. And like more than that too. 
right now the artists that are blowing up are in the African diaspora. Okay. Um, so you see that you go, okay, there's a market for this. There is a market for this. Okay. And it's a very, so it's relevant. It's very relevant. It's a very quick market for it. Okay, I like the analysis. Aesthetically, I aesthetically I like it. I would have to see his portfolio. Sure. So I want to see. You need to see those if, thousand works of art. Not a thousand works of art. Yeah. I mean, I, I you say that like... You want to see range? When you see portfolio, are you looking for range? I'm looking for, I say, 10 to 12 artworks. And I want to see that when I see your artwork, it's recognizable. For example, when you see a Pollock in a museum, right. you know it's a Pollock. Totally, when you see yeah, a Basquiat, right. a you see it's a Basquiat. Yeah. If an artist is making a work, but the style is 10 different styles and 10 different works, that's not going to work because like no one's going to like recognize his style then. So I'm like the whole idea of seeing the portfolio is can i see a pattern is there a repetitive pattern or is there anything that like is repeated in the work that like could stand out and be like okay i know that this is so and so's work and so once that's done i would like call the artist in or like take the artist out for lunch or like just hang out with the artist it's very important for galleries or gallerists or dealers to actually have a relationship with the artist. If I don't get along with you as a person, our business relationship's not gonna work. So at that point, I have no option but to move on to the next artist, even though everything lines up and everything else. And the artist will find someone else. Because obviously I'm not the only person who's thinking like this. Like right. most galleries are thinking like in a similar manner. Are there some intangible things you look at that might matter? Like if they've done a collaboration or if they've been like, if, if they have like a murals. celebrity collab or something. And then does that give any, does it matter? Does it not 100%, matter? 100%. I mean, okay. I've placed artworks with numerous celebrities. It definitely pushes the career up. Like... Um, where you get placed. I mean, if Justin Bieber posts like an artwork, like Justin Bieber posted an artwork of like Mr. the artist and like I had so many people asking me for artworks by him right then and like the younger music generation and like in from like LA. So like 100% if like an artist is promoting you, obviously like Beyonce and Jay-Z promoted Basquiat for the Tiffany campaign and like even if people who were completely oblivious to the art world, did not know anything about the art world. They looked at that and they were like, who is that artist? It educated a bunch of people that didn't. It educated younger people that might have been familiar with the luxury world, uh, like Tiffany as a brand, but like didn't know or knew of Basquiat as a name, but did not were not familiar with his artwork. Like the billboards kind of made them familiar. So absolutely it like helps. Okay, so recognizable. There's some market, right? So it's relevant at the time. Maybe some endorsements, maybe some not. And then you got to like them. Makes makes sense. You want to like the people you work with. And then what happens? So then and they I just mean, become part of your portfolio. I mean, the cherry on top would actually be to like, finish the last like part would be if they actually have a track record of some sort of sales sure. it doesn't have to be like sales that are like in the ten thousand range or twenty thousand range it could be sales for like a thousand two thousand dollars okay so it's but, pretty low it could yeah, it could be low it could it doesn't be, matter it could be very low i mean it's okay. our job to like price it the right way mm -hmm. and like push the artist up but like if there is a track record of sales we know there's a market out there even more in a more so concrete manner so then, so you start working with them and so then you're then, showing them off to your, your network. So, so then we start working with them. So different artists have like a different plan. So this is where uh, we have a coffee, we sit down, I like them, we like decide to work together. We send them a representation agreement. So once we are in that agreement, them and us would sit down and we would make a plan for their year so how many group shows do we want them to be in when would be a good time after this many group shows to have a solo show do we want to put them on artsy and online platforms so people who don't know their work and like access it online or is it like do we want it to be more just controlled and we want it to go just to our network and just to like certain top clients what the artist wants like this plan that we're making is very much a collaboration between the artist and us. So like it's it's how the artist sees their market growing and what the artist wants in addition to what the gallery thinks is beneficial for the artist. Give me an example of something like uh, an artist might want or in your experience, they've wanted some like crazy thing that you've never even heard of. I mean, like some artists would be like, 
I want my artworks to be in the most exclusive celebrity homes and like highest collector rankings. I don't want random people to have access to my artworks even though the artwork will only the artworks are only five thousand dollars and in that situation i have to honor that i might have a whole wait list of people that are emerging art collectors that want the artwork but because the artist wants a certain kind of collective i tell the artist where we are uh, placing the artworks every time so the artist knows where the artworks are in that situation i mean I'm placing the artworks with only the top collectors and like it's a more much more restrained market. In that case, I'm not putting it on artsy or online platforms and I'm not marketing in a, it in a way where like it's not even accessible to most people. So if like I get them an interview with Flaunt magazine and people who are reading Flaunt magazine are most people that are reading it are like coming to me and like saying I want this artist I'm not even able to provide it but like there are people that are reading Flon magazine that are obviously top collectors and like happy to like give them the artworks but like chances of getting to those collectors through some public source like that is very low it's usually personal relationships and you send pdfs to them personally and that's how they get it now a completely different requirement for an artist is like i want to be a hype artist i want to be like known by everyone i want my artist to be like in the public eye i want to sell it to as many people be democratic in that case we want to like market it as much as possible in magazines and like online platforms so like we can give the artist the market that they are desiring so you have to be protective of it in a certain sense and you know i i do know that Sotheby's, Christie's, they will have auctions and they'll have a high price like they think it'll go for and then a low price. And oftentimes if it doesn't, if whatever the bid doesn't meet that low price, they won't sell. Like you said, you want it in certain celebrities' homes or certain collectors' homes and not some random person. And what, it, what interests me is that it goes against basic economic theory of an object is worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. And it's almost like there's a certain member of the art community who's like, well, we don't care that someone's not willing to pay for it now because we think someone will pay for it later. Well, so auctions are something that like artists get into when they're a little bit more established. Artists want, and it's beneficial for the artist, to have a controlled market and not go into auctions for as long as they can, frankly. And the reason for that is very simply that like, once artists go into auctions, it's kind of like out of their control. They can't control their market anymore. It's open source and it's public. When an artist does very well in auction, obviously it's very, it's beneficial to them because then they can like push up their primary market prices to a certain extent. And you have to repeatedly do those high prices like Jordi Kerwick right now he's a very hot artist and like his auction prices are consistent and up there every single time if you just have one big auction record and you're not getting the same auction record again again that's a really bad look and actually harmful for your market now completely opposite to that is if your artwork does not do well say it goes in the lower estimate or less than the lower estimate. So typically in an auction, there's a re reserve price. That is the minimum price that like they would accept for the art to be considered sold, which is less than the minimum estimate, the low estimate. So if it sells lower than low estimate, it's actually also not so great for the artist market because now they have to sell less than like whatever the estimated value is in the market because that's what... so. Auctions are like open source. Anyone can go see what prices it was go it, it went for. It's just like the stock market. I mean, if you see that a stock is going for ten dollars, you're not gonna go buy it for fifty, right? Then you'll wait for it to come to the market for ten dollars again and try to buy it for that price. So it's very tricky. I mean, in one hand, if it does really well, it's very it's beneficial to you. But if it doesn't do that well, it's breaking your market and on the contrary if it doesn't sell at all that's a bi that means it's the lot has been passed 
that's even worse for you because i mean no that like shows that like there's not enough people reputation. in the market yeah, yeah. there's not enough nobody people cares. in the market <laughs> nobody yeah. cares no one wants your painting yeah. how and do you how do you structure your deals with them and so for all the work that you're doing setting them up what's the fee you're taking just um, to, it really and is depends. it based on sales it's exclusively yeah it's based on sales okay. exclusively okay um sometimes artists can sign works uh, for more established artists sometimes we'll like pay them half up front sometimes we'll buy them out right there's it's different ways to deal with different artists depending on the level i mean obviously if i go to like a cause who's a huge artist and very well known i'm gonna have to buy the artwork okay. up front right he's not gonna it. give it to me in consignment unless he's in a very 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 good mood right. you know he might but never if like, you're listening yeah right. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like it, it never hurts to ask i mean as an entrepreneur that's my number one rule that like it never hurts to like put yourself out there totally so if you're listening please give me a consignment yeah. but like uh um, so is, is it typically like 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent um What's so the... so it ranges between five to fifty percent and it depends on how established the artist is Obviously, if the artist has a market and he's very established, we would get a lower percentage versus a brand new artist that doesn't have any market. We would get a higher percentage because we have to put that much more effort. And it's more on my name that the person is buying an artwork rather than the artist. Right, name. they trust you. So like, yeah. So like, it really depends. It can even defer work to work. It doesn't even have to defer person to person. Like sometimes if we're doing a s exhibit, a show with them, I'm putting a lot of money in for marketing and like putting it all up, installation. There's a lot of costs. So like obviously we get a higher percentage out of like the show versus in general when we work with the artists, we get a lower percentage compared to because we don't have to do any of those things then. So like it really depends on what the current their current situation is in the market and what we require for the gallery at the thing so it's all like it's all situation based so there's no one formula for it it's an art and a science yeah it's it's an art and a science there's general principles but like you can put the wrong chemical in and everything yeah. could blow up do you have like you personally when you go out on your business do you say okay this year i'm going to sign up 10 new artists or do you go this year, I'm going to focus on, I'm going to like cut the fat, let's say, let's say you work with 100, but you really like just 20 of them and 20 of them are selling. How, I, do, how do you do I that every year? I always put like a maximum number that I'm going to represent within the year of new artists. What's, what's the number? I'm not going to tell you that. Is it like um, hundreds though? Or is it like tens? Or is it like, no, it's is it not like hundreds. Five? It's like the tens. Okay. And, and are you cycling through or is it like you're adding tens to your portfolio every year? Um, I'm adding tens to the portfolio every year. So like the reason for that is as the artist gets more established, it's easier for me to like place their artworks. So it kind of goes on almost autopilot. I still have to place the works with museums. I still have to place the works, like get them new projects and like still have to work with them. But that initial stage of building an artist is 100 times harder than like once there's a track record and then like the artist already has some sort of a market that like we're selling to what are things that make your job hard like really hard so an example that comes to mind in my head is you're repping them you're about to do a gallery and they're selling art on the side for cheaper that's 100 percent a big that's annoying. no no yeah okay. and i've dropped artists so you establish for that rules up front of like yeah. these are the th so that's one of the things not to do what are some of the other things that are like huge red flags or well i mean so there's deal breakers so so there's def several several different red flags, right? Um, I understand that like selling artworks on the side is a big no-no. Again, this is why it's important to have a relationship with your artist. I'm very happy to have a chat with the artist. And like if there's one friend of theirs that they really want to give the artworks to, I'm very happy to forego my con commission for that one artwork or two artworks to their friends. But it's my responsibility to keep the prices up high in the market. And a lot of the times when artists do that and sell artworks in the side for cheaper, the artworks show up in auctions for a lot cheaper because they want less money because obviously they got it for lesser money. So they're okay to like sell it for lesser and that hurts the, the artist market overall. And like... I don't want to be dealing with someone who's doing that. I mean, this is very much like any other business. 
they're like our partners so we need to have that established trust with them so if they do that like that's a very big no-no another thing that's a very big no-no for emerging artists is if they have too many demands right if you're not in a position to make demands and you're like being an <laughs> annoying little shitty yeah. thing like yeah. i will drop you because yeah. that means in the longer so term does yeah, that happen like, a lot it happens often enough. Yeah, I was yes. going to say, I can see it happening a good amount. Yeah. So yeah. like, which Egos is why like, away. which is why like most galleries and like <laughs> representation contracts, if they have a period of time and the artist is being annoying, they won't renew the contract again. So it's harmful for the artist. They think they're being a cool little thing, but like also always remember the art world is very tiny. All the museum people. Everyone knows each other. All the art galleries, all the dealers, everyone is friends we're all doing business with each other we're all working in the secondary market it doesn't matter if you're the top gallery or the bottom gallery everyone is working with each other on commissions so like as an artist if you try to fuck with me and like other dealers are my friends they're not going to want to work with you because of what you do to me it's a great way to get blackballed it's it's a great way to get get blackballed and like everyone is yeah we're all competing with each other to get like the best thing and like get the best artworks and be the best gallery but on some level like we have loyalty towards each other because we're supporting each other's market. I'm buying ga works from their galleries to like send to my clients and they're buying works from my galleries to sell send to their clients. So like we have a longer term relationship. So like if some if an artist does that, it's like very harmful to them. So like that's some some situation. Another situation is an artist like and this has happened too. like, you know, a lot of artists start together and some become bigger than other artists and like if you start comparing yourself with the person who's done the best in your group and start pricing your artworks according to that like you're a fool because you don't have the same market as them so like if an, an artist tries to go and do that like that's a very good way to like not get your contracts renewed we'll be right back to the episode after this quick break Warby Parker offers everything you need for happier eyes, and you can shop with them online or in stores. Check out Warby Parker's home try-on program for yourself. Order five pairs of glasses to try at home for free. It ships free to you and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash ship it. This episode is also brought to you by Fight Camp. They offer thousands of classes with new workouts added each week, so you'll always find something new. You can get a killer workout done in as little as 20 minutes. And don't worry if you don't have any boxing experience, because Fight Camp has your back. They've created programs specifically designed to teach you the basics of boxing and kickboxing, so you can build a strong foundation. Fight Camp even comes with all the gear you need to start boxing from home, including a freestanding punching bag, boxing gloves, quick hand wraps, and smart punch trackers that provide real-time data during your workout. So head on over to joinfightcamp.com slash startup to storefront and get free shipping with your first order. Now, back to the episode. When you meet a new artist, has it ever happened where you're blown away, you're thinking, so they're not signed yet, and you're like, this person's going to blow up, and I'm going to help them. And then you, almost like an early NFT, you're like, I'm going to buy five, 10, 20 pieces. I've done that. I've 100% done that. Okay. I've had like sold out shows with these artists too. So like, so you're like creating a market, but you're, yeah. Yeah. Like there is something to go about this, right? As art dealers, we're going to art fairs every other month, if not every month, we're going to art shows every Thursday. We are. Is that, is that the day of the week that they're Thursdays on? is the show, the day the art shows open globally. That's the day. So like, I'm going for art shows every Thursday. I'm going for private viewings. I'm seeing the market. I'm seeing a lot of artworks, you guys. Like, I see, see you, like hundreds of artworks. You see where the market's basis. moving, your fingers on the pulse. So, like, there's some sort of inclination to know what market is actually like doing well. When I'm seeing an artwork that's like blowing me away, there's definitely something to it. I'm not saying that like I'm the be all and end all sure. of like, but you're aware, I'm not you're like aware God's enough. word, yeah. but like 
I have enough experience to like realize that there's something to it and there's something that can be done. And like for us, like if artists are signed with us, if they're in a situation where they're unable to buy higher end art supplies, the gallery would help them to do it. And like there's always contracts where like we'll front them money and as the artworks sell, we get reimbursed for the money that we are putting in them up front. There are situations where like we might loan them money to make a body of work. There are situations where we'll commission artworks specifically for the gallery and we'll pay the artists up front. Like again, everything is situation based, but like the best way to explain the art dealer or gallerist and like an artist relationship is they're both two halves of like the same yeah, pie. It's a symbiotic like, relationship. Yeah. Like how, how has the NFT movement changed things from from in your world, if at all, in, in what you do specifically in terms so of like galleries? I am actually one of the largest female collectors of NFT in the United States. I'm very bullish in it. Is it the same analysis you do? Is it the same like, so instead of the artist, you're looking for teams? Quite similar. So with NFTs, so first let me go into what I, my perspective on NFTs is. The art world has historically had really high bar barriers to entry. So you might be the richest person and you still would not get preference to get like a particular artwork because that's not how the art world works we cater to our long-standing collectors before brand new collectors just throwing in the money because in the primary market the prices are quite set we don't want to sell artworks for double of what it's actually worth because that hurts the artist market too so for a long time the tech world which has a lot of money in there had to overcome these huge barriers of entry and start collecting from a lower level from like artists that they might not actually want but like to get into the galleries program to like get to a level where like they can buy the artworks that they want and there's always been this, that kind of aversion to selling to that clientele in the art world now the art world is very small it's very click we are all amongst each other and everything and that's how like it's historically worked and it's changing now and we're letting more people in but it's a slow change so what nfts did was created a whole new genre of artworks that were dealing with the discrepancies within the art world like having an open leisure so everyone can see what it's like bought and sold for in the art world that's not typically how it's done like everything is done very hush hush like it's not very open for people to see so like nfts you can see how much it's like bought and sold for and like you can track provenance all the way back to the first owner provenance is very important pa paperwork uh to see like if the art artwork is even authentic or not mm -hmm. The tech world created this whole new genre of artworks that like they have accessibility to, but not only them, they've opened the accessibility to a whole new world that wouldn't usually be purchasing artworks because like they didn't know how to, they didn't know if it was an asset and they very clearly stamped it as an asset, which all artworks are assets, but like it's hard to convince someone unless they know that they can make money off of it or there's a chance that they can make money off of it. I think it was a phenomenal thing and a phenomenal new addition to like the art world. The NFT artists also came up with making artworks which is called profile picture artworks that means several different different editions of the same artwork which are each unique, which was absolutely amazing because Usually in the traditional art world, those works are individually considered unique or if they're all the same, they're con considered an addition. So this was something new. So like definitely I think the acceptance in the older generation of like the art world is slower, but NFTs are here to stay. They are here to stay. It's like Bitcoin in 2014 and 2015, like... I mean, people were buying it. People knew it was going to become like an asset. There was a whole crew of people that was buying it, but it wasn't as widely accepted as it is today. So in 10 years, NFTs are also going to be, we'll see more real world benefits of NFTs. I mean, 
Web3, we'll see more Web3 companies coming out and Web3 companies and like knowing a lot of people in banking. I know like a lot of people in banking are trying to see what these right. Web3 companies are doing and they're yeah. interested. So yeah. like, I think like in the next like five to 10 years, NFTs and Web3 companies is going to be a big part of the art world as well. As, as a collector, so from your perspective, so let's call this like, this is the beginning of the of this new art renaissance. We're in this NFT tech enabled era. Like I'm, I'm very much holding everything I own. I don't think there's a single, I also do real estate development. And so that concept for me is not crazy of holding for like a minimum of two to five, six years. Like that's easy. And so when I think about this time, NFTs today are like very much representative of, of early new stuff. And so to me, I don't know why people are selling them, but there's so many people flipping them. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, everyone loves money. It doesn't matter who you are. But I think long term, right? Like, what is your stance on it? Do you flip and also hold well, or are I you... hold 99% of the so time. So you're holding. But like... Well, can you explain to people why? Since you're in the art world and so you've seen... Well, I mean, like, for example... I'll you're give young. You, like, I'll give you an idea of, like, Board Ape Yacht Club, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I got into it very early, earlier than most people. And like I, my NFTs and my apes and everything are worth a lot more money. And like, I would say like I've made millions of dollars of not profit, of like perceived profit. Paper, you paper, imagine, theoretical. On yeah. paper, like, you yeah. know, like it's not like, I don't really know how much I've made, but like I would believe if I sell them, I would have made some kind of profit in them. I'm holding them because I don't want to make a profit on them. I want to see what their long-term benefits are like board api club just came up with like this whole metaverse thing which is cool i mean to us at a certain extent you have to buy nfts because you th you're genuinely in it you're, you're and you enjoy it yeah. i mean like a gamer like yeah you know where is uh, this gonna go yeah what are they building what are is they the building team what's equipped? like the next Let's thing like yeah you, i mean you it has to excite you if you're just doing it from the money perspective there's a lot of flippers and there's a lot of people that are doing it from the money perspective and like honestly that's good for me as a long-term holder of these things i like they're creating a market and they're pushing the prices up so the flippers are good for the market for me because that means more and more people are coming into the market to like make a quick dollar but at the same time like i'm always a long-term investor in everything i don't think of like short-term things and it's worked in my favor and i will sell things if i see like a nft project that like has no backing to it so like even with like an nft project there is a formula or basic principles to see if this is going to be like a long-run project or not what's like, your formula well, the first thing is I always check the roadmap and what where their roadmap ends. How big are they thinking? How big are they thinking? How long do they think they can accomplish these things in? I would say roadmap is the same thing as like a business plan for a startup. If you're investing in a startup, you're going to look at the business plan. So if you're investing in an NFT, don't be blind. Like, look at the roadmap. That's do you track it, though? Do you track to see that they're actually hitting the, set, the points that they set out to so, do? Yeah, so like I would, I would be tracking to see if they're actually hitting the points that they set up. I would track the developers and see what the developers are saying. Are I would, they doxxed? Are they not doxxed? Yeah, like, yeah. are they, like, talking about the project? Have they just gone silent after? There's a lot of cash grab projects in NFTs, which is definitely what I would, like, if there's a cash grab project, like, I would sell it. Like, if there's a project that I don't actually believe in, I would sell it. So I'm, but, like, if I believe in your project, then I won't. If I know the developers pers personally, there's no way. If I get a NFT for free that's gifted to me, there's no way <laughs> I'm selling it. But like, if there's, I, I will buy and sell projects that are like quick money makers. Cause like, I mean, at the end of the day, I still have to like make sure that I'm recovering the money that I put in, right? But uh, at least recovering the money that I put in. I mean, I think in the long term, you'll obviously gain a lot for most of the projects, not all of them. Another thing that like you need to look at is the volumes. Are the volumes high? Are a lot of people wanting to get into it? What is the post launch marketing that they're doing? What are the things that like, are they giving free airdrops to you? Are the free airdrops worth anything? 
are they planning to develop a gaming software or are they planning to incorporate the NFT as a pass to a concert or like give them give people some real world experiences like what are they doing to actually make money within like their own ecosystem are you within the art world that you're in are you someone who's like crazy in terms of nfts like are you would you say you're an early adopter and everyone else is skeptical or would you say most of the people understand it because they're in the art market i was an early adapter i've been in it for almost two years now so i was an early adapter uh, i still think we are in the early adapter stage so it's not too late to get yourself immersed in it like it's the same thing if you wait for if you waited for bitcoin to get to thirty thousand dollars to buy it i mean you were making a lot less money than the people who got in it for at a thousand dollars or like a hundred dollars so like i mean there's definitely a risk factor to it but there's a risk factor to everything and like in finance high risk high return so like you have to like be a smart investor and look at your position and make sure that your portfolio of artworks is some that are safe and some that are higher risk and some that are medium risk like that's on you personally as a collector of how risk averse you are and how safe you want to be that's like the general theory right like if you don't risk it, like you're not going to get the biscuit. On the other side, you have Masterworks, right? Which is like fractionalized, but mm -hmm. original arts. Yeah, fractionalized original art. Honestly, I am not a big user of it. A lot of people are. And the reason I'm not a big user of it is very simply, frankly, I can buy emerging artists myself and I own the whole artwork. I would rather have something that I can put in my wall rather than like say that I own a percentage of an artwork at some point somewhere. Yeah. And that's just me personally. Not as fulfilling. Yeah, I mean, but like there's a lot of just finance based investors too, like just like stocks. Like, I mean, if I buy a stock of Apple, that doesn't mean I actually own Apple. Right, right. <laughs> but like, I mean, as an investor, that would make sense for me to do it. So there's a lot of people that are doing that too, to be a bit diplomatic, if you would say, but like, there's a lot of people that are doing that too, that like, are just in it for like the prices to go up. I mean, if you bought an Andy Warhol on Masterworks and like now like the 195 million Andy Warhol sold, naturally your token is going to be worth more today and you can sell it and make some money. So like no judgment to people who are doing that for sure. But like, me personally, I'm not very into it. So I can't really give you the logistics or walk through the statistics of like how to like navigate that world. Yeah. Well, one of the things while we're on the subject of NFTs, I've always been fascinated by the ability of NFTs to kind of level the playing field in terms of what artists can make after the initial sale of their piece. So uh, as an example, I just listened to a story about this artist who uh, his friend was a collector. And so his friend really liked his work, uh, wanted to... to purchase some of it. So he purchased one piece for, let's say $50,000. And then a couple of years later, he ended up selling it for like $2 million, $3 million, like an inc incredible escalation of price. And that sale right there broke their friendship because the artist felt like his friend had robbed him of profits, where his friend felt that the artist should thank him for boosting the value of his work. And what I think the potential of NFTs to do, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on this, the potential of NFTs is that you could theoretically solve this problem where the artist will get a percentage of every sale going forward. Well, so in this case, the artist was stupid because NFTs are a smart contract and you can put in a ro resale royalty in it. And most artists do put in a resale royalty in it. So like technically he should have gotten a percentage of the resale royalty. Well, this was before NFTs. This was like, oh. a, yeah, this was oh, a, so, oh, a so regular the, art sale. So if this is a regular art sale, like yeah. again, now this is something, I don't know when this artist did this or whatever, but this has been an ongoing problem in the art world since the 70s. So like Rauschenberg back in the first auction that he was in, he sold his works for hundreds of dollars and they went for several hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he made a huge, he threw a huge fit and he was like, I didn't get any money of this hundreds of thousands of dollars. But like, the, and it was the exact same thing you said. And the collector was like, I made your market. Like, I don't care if you didn't make money from this piece, but you're going to make money from future pieces. 
And going back to what I said, like NFTs are solving certain principles in the art world that you couldn't actually fully uh, do it. I mean, you can't, you don't know if an artwork is selling privately. The artist will never know even if there's a contract of getting some sort of royalty from it. The artist can not, like there's a good chance that the artist will never know if a collector sells it to another collector. So like the collector is not going to give you any extra money. On the other hand, as well, like music NFTs are revolutionary right now. I mean, Snoop Dogg, it's something that like is changing the music world very fast. Like sound X, Y, Z. He's like, crazy. He's he's so at the forefront. He's I mean, it's, I, it's like bananas. Aside from he, him doing. being one of my favorite artists. I like love you, Snoop, if you're listening to this. But like <laughs> I do think like he is a revolutionary. Oh, 100 like, percent. Especially right now. Yeah. I, I bought into an NFT project on the Cardano blockchain uh-huh. and then Snoop. So I bought in and then like maybe three weeks later, Snoop announced this huge partnership with this project. It's called the Claymates. And I was like, holy shit. I and mean, that's it. And now every, all, you see all the prices going up. They're building a, it's called Baked Nation. They're building this metaverse with Snoop. I mean, like, like think about this, right? The music industry, like the labels take a good chunk right, of like right. what you're trying to, what like you deserve. Like if you're an artist, like labels are betting on hundreds and thousands of artists on an every single day basis. I personally know music managers that are not like, focusing on a lot of artists they're like kind they're focusing on their main artists but like they're like taking a bet like if one of them like blows up by mistake they make a lot of money out of it i mean for established and non-established artists like if you're buying a kanye album like you don't care who's the person promoting it like you're buying it because you want to hear kanye's music and like that's what he did last time and like did it on his own platform and he made a lot more money than he would have if he was like going through a record label and the same thing with like snoop like with like his nft sound xyz nft that he took out like he made so much money but like he deserved it like at that point the labels aren't really giving these artists too many things they're not giving the artists a lot of support yeah if you're a mid-career artist and just starting up and like yeah you're getting support yeah they're boosting your sales but after a certain point they're like basically just taking advantage advantage of you and like the resale contracts i'm definitely going to be blacklisted from like the music industry after this but like it's great because like i think i think it's time for like the labels to get into the nft industry and like work with the artists so then the artists can get their resale royalties and like higher resale royalties and stuff like that as well like i mean otherwise these very popular artists are free to just like take out like their own nfts and like have actually and like now people are selling the nfts as if like you actually own a couple of seconds of the song so if the couple of seconds of the song is used at like an advertisement you're actually making money right. it's like the same thing as like franchising world, so yeah. a song like i'm thinking about doing a project where it is a part of me that really wants in another part that doesn't but it's basically this concept where like we, we built the brewery and so we own the building and on the outside of the building, it's like obviously great for art. And so there's all these street artists I know that have never understood the concept of making money as their art sells, but they have like a lot of cred, but in the street art game, like they're legends in the street art game, which for the sake of markets, let's call it a niche market, but they don't know anything about wallets or anything about like web three. And so there's this bridge we have to build with them. And then the concept is we have them do this huge, I mean, huge, like way bigger than maybe like three of these in terms of size. And then every quarter we change it. When they're done, we take pictures of the NFT, we sell them, and then we invite new artists on a quarterly basis to basically create new arts. And we just have this like, it allows more people to come. It, it, it's like a gallery in the sense of, uh, but, we're, but it's a real life. It's like real estate. And so, but, I don't know. What do you think? What are your thoughts? I think it's a good idea. Like, again, we're so new in the web free space. Anything that you try right now, even if it fails, it's like it's worth it to go and try it just in case. Like you never know what's going to blow up. And like in a market that's so early stage, like it's worth it taking a chance. I mean, for me, it's just like fun, you know. It's like it's, we have new technology. Yeah, Let's it's, try it's it. New Let's technology. get street it's art, exciting. Street like, it is, and I yeah. Think, the thought of like, so, so like my life today is I can put my energy into things that I know will work. I want to do that. Like that's high yield. And so then it's like to, to do something that 
it's not, I don't care about failing. I don't care about being wrong. None of that bothers me, but it's to put energy into something that I know might never work because it's so early is like, uh, do I really want to be, it's almost like a dumb business decision. You see what I'm saying? I, yeah. Because I, I, and the odds of it hitting are, let's call it monumentally low. So I don't even think about the hitting. I just go, eh, eh, you know. I mean, you know, (laughs) the odds of any new startup hitting. Right. Zero. Is very monumentally low. Yeah. So like, I mean. I just think it's good for the, like a part of me just feel like this is good for the artists. It's, it's a new way for them to get exposure and it's a potential revenue maker for them if we do it correctly and if they understand like we should market this, let's market I, it. I agree with that, but like also something that like comes up in mind that I've been discussing a lot in the past few days with my artists is that most artists have terrible finance management. Yeah, for Terrible. Sure. For sure. I obviously try to help my artists to like figure them, like tell them or whatever, but like, and like try to like tell them how to deal with their finances. But I've seen like artists make $5,000 and they'll, they'll go spend $5,000. And I'm like, why? Like, why not like save or anything? So like, that's something if like that also needs to be like added to the art world. And I'm actually thinking of like starting a division for that separately within the gallery because it's not that much money for me to like make. But like, I feel terrible about these artists. I mean, these are I know artists that have made hundreds of thousands of dollars with me in the last year that are like absolutely broke right now. And I'm like, how? How do you spend that much money in a year? Because you're going and buying tell you? freaking Bottega Veneta pants and Balenciaga jackets. Like, dude, like, see your situation save and, like, go buy a house, if anything. Like, <laughs> if you've bought a house and you're in a position that, like, you know, you're like, yeah, I can't, like, I'm struggling to keep up with the payments. It's okay. You bought an asset. But if you're going and buying a depreciating asset to look cool, like, Artists really like this is a PSA for everyone. Like, please, 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 when you're making money, save money and like look at your future. This is your business. Keep money aside for your business. So, like, if there ever is a rainy day, I mean, we're talking about recession coming in the next couple of months or like soon. In a recession, typically, the artists that are established do really well because more people want to invest in like, the art world it's a safer bet but like for the emerging artists it's a very hard world because no one wants to take a chance or like it's harder to take a chance in a market that's like so volatile like that so like it's important for artists to keep some money away like it's smart finance management buy assets that are going up in value invest in crypto invest in stocks invest in like gold invest in silver invest in bonds invest in anything that can like that's gonna hold value but like do not be an idiot and like spend i'm not saying don't go buy these things i mean it's i I understand you need like a lifestyle (laughs) live your life and like live your life but like live your life where it's in a way where it's smart to live your life yeah like don't like go and spend everything on like something that's not going to give you a yield. Let's do some hot takes as we finish. What, what are your favorite NFT projects today that you're looking at? Uh, Board Ape Yacht Club is my absolutely favorite NFT project. Another one that I really love is Inbetweeners, Inbetweeners by okay. uh, Gian Perro. Another one that I really, really am bullish on is Proof Collective and Moonbirds. Those three are probably coming to my mind as like the top three uh, NFT projects. I'm very excited to see in the NFT world what the fashion NFT world comes mm, up with. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot of echoes. There's things that have come out, but like nothing has like come out that's like crazy revolutionary right now. So that's that's what's like exciting me and like music NFTs. Have you ever met Banksy? N- no. <laughs> Has anyone ever met Banksy? Does anyone ever knows what he looks like, or yes. she? Is it a he? Yes. Yes. Okay. People have met him. He Banksy had a show in LA years, years, years ago where he was selling artworks and prints for two, three hundred dollars. And there was an elephant at the show. It was a huge show and people have met him. But he's from my understanding a lot older than me. <laughs> so I haven't like come across him, at least knowingly, in the art world. I do sell a lot of Banksy works. Does he work with dealers or no? He does. He yeah. does. So he has a team. There's a huge secondary market for Banksy works. So yeah. like most of the sales I would say right now is done through the secondary market dealers now. Yeah. The Sotheby's thing was 
I mean, definitely planned. I can't, I can't imagine that was an accident. Oh, he planned that. I mean, he, no, I know he, he planned it. Yeah. Oh. He, I mean like, but as a whole. You think Sotheby's? And when I saw that, that, I was like, that art just skyrocketed in price. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's the coolest yeah. thing yeah. that ever happened. Any it was collector. a cool event. It was yeah. a really, really cool event. I yeah. mean. But he also doesn't work with dealers. Like when he was selling paintings out of Central Park for like you know, right. 10 bucks each. And then the he, next he day posted about he's it. He's not represented by anyone particular. But he works with a lot of dealers. It seems like it would go against his mantra to be represented in, in like a, I think that's a binding the beauty. contract. That's yeah. the beauty of what he's trying to create. I mean, like his authentication body is best control. And they do a phenomenal job in like tracking the artworks, working with dealers. Like I feel no resistance into like if I'm selling an artwork to a client, just emailing them and telling them who the client is and who the artwork is going to because they're so easy to deal with. Banksy is like an amazing artist anyways. He's a revolutionary in the British art market. Like I think Damien Hirst and like Banksy are the people that like completely moved the art market into like Damien Hirst did it for the contemporary arts in the UK and like UK obviously and like Paris and Europe in general has a long standing reputation for being very immersed in culture and art. But like they got it out of like those traditional artworks into like something more contemporary. And then Banksy took it further and took street art in UK into like a realm that's like considered like very pristine and sought after. What what's next for you personally? We have an NFT project that's coming out called Ooh. Shama Shorties. Shama Shorties, okay. Yeah. When is uh, it coming? When does it drop? Well, so we haven't decided a final drop date. Can we get on the white list? If you, you can don't get ask, on the whitelist. You yes, can't you get, can I mean, get on the whitelist. The whole list. team, we'll, we'll buy. Yeah, the whole team. Like, What I'm are you happy. selling? Do you know your price yet for your um, initial? You'll know a week before we come out. So, Are you doing we, a Discord, all that? Yeah, we're doing okay. a Discord, all of that. We're marketing. We just had like a Forbes article that was written about it. So like if you Google it, you could like find all the information there. It's called Shama Shorties. Um, so that's coming up. We have shows at the gallery with artists like every other month. Okay, so this is like a real life utility. You get to see the art in person. Mm -hmm. Love it. Who's, uh, who's on the team? You have an artist. And yeah, then... we have an artist called Lindsay Dawn on the team. And she is very, very popular. Everyone from like Russ Westbrook to LeBron to like Kylie Jenner. LA based. Works. Like, is she LA based? Oh, you... uh, she is yeah. LA based, yes. And you have Dev? Yeah, we have a Dev. Yeah. The cool thing about this is it's actually female led, which is a very small percentage of the NFT in world. NFTs. Yeah. And then on top of that, we are also at 50% sales of the project. Uh, we are going to be donating money to certain anti-trafficking charities around the world. So like it's a it's utility based. You get and like with this NFT, you'll read about it. You get a percentage off depending on rarity of the NFT with to buy like real world artworks mm -hmm. from our gallery and like prints oh, and everything. Oh, look at that. Yeah. So That's like, what's up. It's kind of it's it's kind of cool. You'll get like I'm excited. Uh, exclusive streetwear that like the artist is designed and like cool like things like that so that's like a project that's coming up and after that we're going to be having we're uh, going to be in art hamptons we're going to be doing in august and then we're doing an all-female show a uh, group show with a lot of very cool artists in august so we have shows every couple of months at the galleries how can people get on your on your email list or your newsletter um you could just go to arushikapoor.com and like put your name in and you get on like the email list uh, automatically or uh, at Arushi Gallery on Instagram or you could follow me on Instagram and I usually respond to as many people as I physically can. The gallery is a better bet because like <laughs> people are responding there too but like if you ever want to reach me directly like you can find you can email me. I usually respond to emails within like a week. I love it. Right on. Well, thank, thank you for coming, coming on the, the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I had like a blast like talking to you guys. Yeah, pleasure. That was our conversation with Arushi Kapoor. If you enjoyed this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Share it around. Recently, we started putting out a bi-monthly newsletter. In the newsletter, we highlight certain moments in our podcast episodes that you may have missed, along with little tidbits of behind-the-scenes information about the recording. You can find the newsletter and sign up for it at our website, startupstorefront.com. Another way you can support the show is to leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. We are found at Startup Storefront on every social media platform, except for Twitter, where we are found at STS Podcast LA. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capellini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capellini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is by Double Touch. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.